Hey Impact, Joe Musso coming at you here with number four of our six part series on the five things and today we're going to focus on number three which is deep relationships. This idea of deep relationships in our culture today is very much against the norm. We as Americans we strive to be John Wayne, Lone Ranger, do it yourself, don't need anybody type people and this robs us of something that God really designed us for and we know that God designed us for deep relationships when we go back to the creation story. God created everything everything he saw that everything was good except for one thing and we see that one thing in Genesis chapter 2 in verse 18 it says then the Lord God said it is not good that man should be alone I will make him a helper fit for him obviously when we look at this passage of scripture we see that God has designed us to enjoy a spouse we also know that God designed us to enjoy relationship with him and we can easily conclude that God designed us to enjoy deep relationship with each other, not just from this Genesis passage, but from the number of times throughout the Bible that God commands us, instructs us to love each other. One of those passages that I have chosen for us to look at comes from Romans 12. And Romans 12 reads, So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, abhor evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, and outdo one another in showing honor. Romans 12 teaches us that we are each unique and we are to use our own unique gifts and our own unique abilities for the betterment of the body. We are also instructed to love each other more than we love ourselves and we're even instructed to bless and love our enemies. So Romans 12 points out that we are meant to be in relationship working together with each other. We also know that the Bible teaches us there is strength in numbers. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 teaches us, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. It's here that I'd like to interject a little bit of a leadership point for you. If you look throughout history, nobody did anything of significance by themselves. They either had a team of people around them or close friends with them helping them accomplish their goals. So we need others more than we might like to admit. So the big question is, what does God's people living in deep relationship with each other look like? Well, what I've decided to do is to take Stephen Mansfield's Five Essentials of a Band of Brothers and morph them for this particular lesson. So let us begin. First, there must be a connection. For some it's hobbies, for others it's sports, for some others it's a common interest, but there has to be a connection for a band of brothers or for a group to exist in a friendship. But for us as Christians, that unifying factor, that common connection is always Christ and the gospel. And we see that Christ even prayed for that in John 17. Just look at how many times Christ asked the Father for us to be one. And he prays that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as you loved me. Second, there needs to be an outspoken, understood recognition of value or honor for those closest to you. These can be gifts, talents, insights, any positive trait you see in your friend and appreciate. And they need to know that you appreciate that quality in them. We see this happening in 1 Samuel 18. David has just walked off the battlefield after killing Goliath into Saul's tent to give a report and he meets for the first time Jonathan, King Saul's son. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Jonathan recognized David's warrior spirit within him and thought to himself, that's a guy I want to hang around with. Why? Because Jonathan shared the same warrior spirit. And what happens next in 1 Samuel 18 is Mansfield's third essential, we need to establish a friendship covenant. 
In verse 3 we read, Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. This covenant between David and Jonathan was so strong that even Jonathan's right to his father's throne didn't trump it. It was the type of commitment that said, no matter what, I'm with you. I will go with you no matter what you do, no matter what you go through, I will be your friend and we will be together. This type of commitment in our culture today is very rare and it's even rare, sadly, in our marriages. The fourth essential of deep relationships is what Mansfield calls a free fire zone. A free fire zone is the type of atmosphere among friends where there is open expression of concerns, disagreements, hurts, all without fear of jeopardizing the friendship. We here at Baynet, with me and my staff, we enjoy this free fire zone and the reason is because we know the value of truth. In John 8 we learn, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Giving the people closest to you permission to speak freely in your life is not only freeing, it's also growing. Why? Because they will notice things in you that you won't notice yourself. And when you understand that they're coming at you with your best interest in mind, out of care, out of love, and you receive that, you can listen to that and make changes to grow. It isn't only growing, but when you listen to them with sincerity and make those changes, you communicate value to those around you, letting them know that their opinion is important. Finally, a culture of deep relationship creates what Mansfield calls a contagious culture. The question Mansfield asks with this is, what type of culture are you creating? Is it toxic or is it life-giving? And I would like to summarize this particular essential with one of Christ's teaching. Matthew 18 verse 20 says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. This was the entire emphasis of winter camp this year, that God would be with us. So I'd like to present to you that when we as believers engage other Christians in deep relationship and honor God in those relationships, Christ will be in our midst and it will be his presence dwelling among us that will make us distinct. And that is that that will make us contagious and other people will want to be a part of the body of Christ. I love you, Impact. You know I do. Wish you a great week this week. God bless you richly.